So this evening we're focused on prescribed fire and we have three speakers joining us to talk about the different land management perspectives around prescribed fire. This fall provided favorable con conditions for prescribed burning in the Tahoe Truckee region. And we know many of you on this call witnessed those burns happening in and around your communities. So uh, before we jump into the presentation, I just wanna remind everyone to please keep yourself muted throughout the presentations. This presentation is being recorded for later viewing and following all of our presenters, we will have a Q&A session with the presenters. We do ask that you type your questions into the chat as we go. You can type them into the chat at any time and we will have staff monitoring the chat, um, recording the questions. And then when we get to the end of the presentations, we'll go through all of the questions that have been put in the chat as well as open it up for additional questions if you have them. So before I hand it over to our partners, uh, I am actually gonna just uh, do a brief introduction of each of them. So first we will have April Shackelford who is the forest fuels manager for the North Tahoe Fire Protection District. Um, then we'll have Dan Patterson present who is the fire management specialist for the Tahoe National Forest East Zone. And finally, we have Joanne Fites, uh, Fites a board member, uh, sorry, board director for Nevada County Resource Conservation District, as well as uh, retired from the US Forest Service. And without further delay, I will turn it over to our first speaker, April. I appreciate being here. Thank you, Nicole, uh, for putting all these um, talks together. And I, I've looked through some of the previous ones and there's been a lot of great information about prescribed fire. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about the fire return interval, the role of fire on the landscape. Um, we're going to look at some before um, and after pictures and some historic pictures and kind of what things look like in the past, what they look like now. Um, and then also just, um, you know, a little bit of that sort of spectrum we have between good fire and bad fire, if you will. Um, how we're getting there uh, as far as fuels reduction projects in and around communities where we can't really have natural fire. Um, and then just um, our role as far as living in a fire prone ecosystem. So uh, yeah, next slide. Um, so this is just a great cookie, uh, a tree cookie of uh, years that have had fire scars going all the way back to 1748. Um, and I just did a little um, number of years to kind of help us get a, a better grasp on what the natural fire return interval is. Um, and I would generally kind of tell people, you know, if we can get on a 20 year rotation with fuels management treatments uh, where they're applicable um, just outside of our community, that would be amazing. But in a lot of cases, our landscape is seeing a return of fire as, as often as four years, at least according to this, uh, this tree cookie and the data it's provided. Next slide, please. And so as we saw, um, we've missed three to six natural fire return intervals um, just up until 1998. And I feel like a lot of our treatments have really started taking place kind of since that time. Um, for the basin, you know, 2007 Angora fire was a big um, eye opener as far as, um, you know, the need for uh, the need for fuels reduction treatments and the need for defensible space. Um, this graphic uh, kind of shows us, um, you know, if we look at the ponderosa pine and it has a 10 year fire return interval. So, yeah, we have a little bit more Jeffrey pine. We're a little higher elevation. Maybe our return interval is closer to 12 years or, or like we saw, it varies between four to even 30 years. If we wait, um, you can see that Western conifer stand replacing so um, that's where we start seeing a bunch of trees die off and uh, a bunch of excessive fuel loading. And so fire does come into those um, areas. Um, we will you know, have catastrophic loss uh, due to just extreme severity and intensity of that fire. Um, and then uh, as I was doing research for this, I just wanted to, to point out that um, historically due to cultural burning and lightning strike ignitions, we had about 500,000 acres in the Sierra Nevada, and this is actually just on U.S. Forest Service property that would that would burn, um, you know, historically in the absence of fire suppression. And with thinning and prescribed fire at, at you know, at our current pace and scale, we're looking at about 35,000 acres. 
So we need a more than a tenfold increase to really um, to see what historic fire was doing on the landscape. And, you know, we certainly can't get out there and, and treat 500,000 acres um, each year. But um, I think with um, some combination of fire use, getting out and doing treatments where we can, um, and then especially buffering out from our communities so that um, approaching wildfire is less of a threat. Um, so, you know, I think we're all working towards some of these increases, but but also realizing um, just some of the limitations that humans have. Um, next slide. So this is just a, one of my favorite photo series of uh, what the landscape looked like um, upon, you know, the first part of European um, settlement. Um, nice open stands. Uh, you know, these are the kind of areas that we can imagine fire moving across the landscape here and um, and basically creating no impact, consuming those low um, low level fuels, cycling them, um, pulsing the, the ground with new with uh, nutrients, um, and then making more water available for some of those bigger trees. So this is ultimately the type of landscape we're looking for um, there in the 1909 picture. And then with, um, you know, it's hard to say how much fire suppression may have taken place between 1909 and 1948, um, but certainly, you know, there was some suppression that happened between 1909 and 1979. That just gets to where um, the landscape's barely recognizable. We do have that that um, same prominent pine in the in the middle there, but um, you know fire in this landscape moves right up the canopy. We have ladder fuels there that take fire from the um, from the ground and up into the upper canopy, creating uh, fire and just high severity fire. Thank you. Um, and so these are a couple um, more local, and um, I did want to give a plug out for the. Fire in Sierra Nevada Forest, the George Gruel book um, that, uh, you know, it came out actually right around 2000, I want to say, uh, more than late 90s. And it just, um, he travels to these locations and um, and takes after pictures. And they're, they're just all quite amazing. So um, it's the books by George Gruel. It's just a photo series, but it really... Um, you know, kind of brings it home as far as like, hey, that's my highway corridor, or hey, you know, um, I manage fuels in Yosemite or whatever. But, but um, it really just um, paints that same picture of, you know, natural fire on the landscape, a hundred years or more of fire suppression, um, and you know, we're looking at situations that will um, that are conducive to catastrophic wildfire. So um, yeah, just. I mean, you all can see just the thickness of fuels growing in there. And then uh, in particularly uh, of importance is the slaughterhouse, or I'm sorry, the uh, the bull wheel in Incline Village um, where, uh, you know, logs were actually moved up and over and out of the basin in this tremendous effort to uh, provide timber for um, our mining endeavors. Um, and then over time, yeah major, major regrowth. Um, next slide, please. And so this just gets a little bit more on the, on the ground as far as what happens if we don't um, allow natural fire to do its thing. Um, excessive down, dead and down fuels, um, excessive understory vegetation and ladder fuels, and then, um, you know, ultimately leading to too much vegetation, um, hence the picture in the upper right. Um, and this is Incline Village actually in the 1980s. Um, so we have seen this kind of thing before and, and really agencies have been busy for a while, um, even prior to the Angora fire um, to remove fuels, um, helicopter logging. And then um, in the lower right uh, is a, a former professor kind of <laughs> befuddled that, what are we really gonna do now? Um, next slide. So with the, the benefits of prescribed fire, and I know many of you are very aware of, uh, you know, why we need fire, but I did want to just kind of list those things and then also just provide a, a you know, a neat picture of what fire kind of looks like on the landscape. Um, 
you know, what low intensity fire kind of is. And it creates this, this heat that does so much in the un underground. Um, but just as you can see, um, two to 40 years in, in the Lake Tahoe Basin for, um, for that natural fire return interval, keeps our ground fuels minimized, um, creates a situation where uh, embers or lightning strikes are only able to create low intensity ground fires. Um, this cycles nutrients. Um, as it alleviates all that competition, it makes water more available for those big old growth trees that, that we're all shooting for as far as land management. Um, improved tree health and tree vigor um, because of the extra water and nutrients. Um, trees are better able to fight off things like fur engraver beetle, um, anosis root rot even, um, other types of bark beetles. Um, even mistletoe in particular is actually um, uh, negatively affected by smoke. So um, there really are a lot of things that tie the ecosystem together um, that wouldn't happen without fire. Um, and then greater carbon retention. So that's just referring to um, the retention of carbon in old growth trees. Of course, as we manage and as we burn, we release carbon, but um, in the long term, um, we have a healthier environment to store carbon in the soil as well as in old growth trees. Um, and then greater soil retention. So the soil itself is kind of, I think, that, that make or break um, component that, that spells out whether we're having a low intensity fire or a catastrophic fire. Um, the loss of soil uh, really makes for recovery of vegetation to take a whole lot longer. Um, next slide, perfect, thank you. Um, so, um, you know, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the, the carbon cycle, and I will say that carbon cycles um, regularly and naturally in a forested ecosystem. Um, but when we add fossil fuel, so when we add carbon from um, previous eons into our current e eon and, and into our current atmosphere, um, that's where we get the imbalance with climate change. So as much as yes, prescribed fire creates carbon, and yes, it contributes to greenhouse gases, it is a natural cycling. Whereas pulling carbon from um, previous plant matter that has you know, since become crude oil and since gets processed into um, gasoline, that's where we have this additional carbon loading. Um, but I wanted to talk more about nitrogen um, and some of the cool things that um, that prescribed fire does, because um, I don't know that this is something that you know people necessarily know a lot about, but um, nitrogen is about one percent of plant matter, and so when it is burned or even when it's heated, um, it becomes plant available. So you know a shrub sitting there doesn't have plant available um, nitrogen; it's sort of locked it up in its leaf matter, and and it's doing its job as a leaf. Um, when we have the combustion, when we have heating, um, we get more nitrogen released into the environment. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it actually in just a second. Um, but I wanted to point out that we have a lot of nitrogen fixing plants. Um, so in the addition of having extra nitrogen available for just general plant uptake due to um, heat and just better availability, we also have plants in our area that are very good at um, assimilating nitrogen right out of the ground, or I'm sorry, right out of the atmosphere. And you can see um, in the diagram, the, the little tree and the, and the lightning um, strike. So that is one of those um, plants that has this nitrogen fact fixing bacteria in its roots. And so these plants are um, remarkable because nitrogen in our environment is um, a double bonded um, molecule and we breathe it in, we breathe it out, nothing happens to us. Um, but plants are able to basically breathe it in, if you will, through roots and through these actinomycetes that attach to the plant root. And they have some that live inside the root and some that live just on the root. But basically they're able to take that nitrogen and pull it into the, the biosphere. Um, and then when those plants burn, then we have even greater ability for nitrogen. So 
Um, some of these plants are what will come in um, right after a fire. Um, and so they'll, you know, they'll, they'll be some of the initial pioneers that start building soil and start building nitrogen for um, other bigger and larger trees. Next slide. So this is some uh, data that I, I uh, worked on as a grad student um, and uh, North Lake Tahoe Fire conducted a prescribed burn and I was going to school at University of Nevada, Reno, and I was able to do um, a lot of studies on, um, on nitrogen in particular. And so, um, so, you know, right here in Lake Tahoe Basin, um, I just wanted to show everybody some of these concentrations, you know, before and after, and this is a, a low intensity prescribed burn. So the, the yellow, orange, and brown, those are soils um, in the, in the burn plot. And then the, uh, the blue, green, and, and light blue are controls. And so you can just kind of see, you know, some of those differences with, um, with the burn plot um, having huge, you know, more than significant uh, increases in, in that NH4 concentration, which is um, really one of the best and most available sources of nitrogen um, for trees. And then in the total mass, um, you know, we lost a ton of litter and duff in the burn process. But, um, and so, you know, so you don't see huge, you, you don't see significant increases for sure. But um, I did want to point out on that Y scale in the, in the total mass um, graph that we're going, you know, okay, half uh, kilogram per hectare. And we had to use uh, metric, you know, back in grad school. So I'm back in the yards and, and acres world again, but, um, but anyway, just pointing out that we go, um, that there's a huge gap in that Y scale. So we went from, you know, maybe 1.6 kilograms per hectare to, to almost 14. And so um, this nutrient pulse is short lived, but, um, you know, as we piece more and more together about ecology, uh, you know, whether it's every four years or every 40 years, um, these increases in nitrogen are um, just great for our, um, our larger trees um, as they, you know, have to fight off their diseases and, and whatnot. So um, just kind of points out that, um, yes, in fact, uh, nitrogen increases after prescribed burning, um, but we do lose a lot of litter and duff in that process. But then a lot of the stuff that was in the ground is actually available for plants um, in the in the soil conditions or in the soil environment. Next slide, thank you. So um, biggest difference between a low intensity fire and a high severity fire is the loss of soil. Um, so this uh, picture I, I found to be particularly um, just striking. This is the 2002 gondola fire that we will all be looking at the fire scar for um, the rest of our lifetimes. Um, super shallow soils in general, um, the, the granite down there breaks down very slowly. Um, and so to have a, a catastrophic fire in there, you know, is the biggest reason why we are, will look at that um, scar forever. Um, and uh, and then just that loss of soil. So we aren't able to capture the nitrogen in soil because it's all lost. Um, the other big um, detriment when we lose the soil is it also contains phosphorus, which is a plant nutrient um, less important than nitrogen. But the trouble with phosphorus is, is that um, it, it does remain adhered to soil particles. Um, and algae in our lake is by and large phosphorus limited. So when we get catastrophic wildfire, we see soil erosion and that soil uh, gets into our creeks, gets into our lake and just feeds um, algae phosphorus, which it loves. And then as it dies back, um, that decomposition starts consuming oxygen, um, creating um, uh, loss of lake clarity, loss of water quality. Um, so this is another big reason why um, it's important to do these, these treatments. Next slide. And then um, just another one kind of similar to the photo series we saw before of 
what can happen, um, you know, and, and, and here's uh, settlers getting ready to cut all of these trees down in, in 1890, um, decided to go elsewhere for uh, whatever reason, because I think they are still in the, in fact, they must be uh, in the background there because they're still around in the year 2000, but, um, but we did see uh, just that influx of fur, fur growing in shade, shaded environments, they create ladder fuels. Um, and if we had a fire return interval, they would ultimately just serve as a nutrient cyclers for these bigger old growth trees. Um, in Yosemite, there's just such a, a great um, fire use and prescribed fire program, um, especially in the Mariposa Grove. And, and they've just done a lot of great work to um, preserve the, the old growth trees in there. And I would always recommend a, a walk through one of those groves if if you have, or if you haven't been there before. Um, and then these are just some pictures to kind of show what um, fuels management looks like. And some of you may be aware, some of you may not, um, you know, it, just some very hardworking individuals that go through, thin out a lot of the, that fur material, um, you know, where we're at with um, the, our level of fuel loading, we really have to come through and do some kind of treatment like this. Um, there are also mechanical um, treatments using um, masticators um, and other even fellow bunchers and logging equipment um, to get some of this stuff out, you know, out of the environment. These are particularly big, um, steep slopes that are not very accessible. And so in a lot of ways, the most ecologically sound way to reduce fuels so that we can get to a point where we can apply prescribed fire um, is to put these individuals in the on the ground out there, um, highly trained, uh, highly hardworking, and, um, and you can just see some of the work they do. So this is um, uh, also an incline village, but going through um, uh, some forested areas, kind of on the backside of Diamond Peak, um, creating piles, and then uh, later those piles were burned, um, and then kind of leaving a situation like you can see in the lower right where we've thinned out a lot of that competing vegetation, but still leaving a lot of good trees and a lot of good shade on the landscape um, to you know, just generally promote forest health. And if we did have a lightning strike or other fire, we're not gonna see catastrophic loss from it. Um, just some more pictures of fire on the landscape, um, pile burning, um, how prescribed fire is conducted um, and some of the just resulting conditions. So in the upper left, there's all this plumbing, as you can see, um, and just hoses. So crew members, um, in this case, there was a 19 acre prescribed fire. Um, the whole thing was lined with water. Um, and, and so crews are able to um, make sure that fire stays within those containment lines. There's water right there available to do so. Um, some of the lightning patterns, um, there's also um, lighting patterns, not lightning patterns, um, but this is just kind of a um, more of a conservative approach to putting fire on the landscape. Can also um, do this like a, these Vs in the, in the event you don't have a lot of fuel. So, um, and that initial start um, really does um, have a huge influence on um, how intense fire gets. And um, just, I, I love, I love this uh, picture there. And that's why I chose it for my background. Um, this is some pile burning that happened in uh, Diamond Peak on the, actually on the lower left and the lower right. Um, some of the resulting smoke and, um, and just kind of, um, you know, what some of the uh, pile burning um, looks like out on the landscape. And then, um, so this is a, a map that um, the TRCD puts together, the Tahoe Resource Conservation District. Um, they work to combine treatments using the Tahoe EIP tracker, which um, all agencies are providing their treatment polygons to the EIP, and sometimes in conjunction directly to the, the RCD to make these maps. Um, so we um, are active. We have a lot of work left to do, but I just wanted to, you know, show some of these images and um, 
yeah, it's a little North Tahoe centric um, just because that's kind of where I am. Uh, but this is a, an example of putting treatments on the landscape to better protect communities. And then so a lot of our areas that we we hike to, we walk to, um, you know, they're, they're kind of the right in our backyard sort of areas. Um, and, you know, I think really there's a lot to be said for um, especially prescribed fire. So that includes pile burning, um, but then um, just also a lot of chipping, masticating and thinning. And then as we move through time, hoping to get to more, more and more, um, you know, just treatments on the ground, prescribed fire where it's appropriate, but also using mechanical treatments where they're appropriate as well. And then um, just some some more um, before and afters, and this is um, also with pile burning um, of you know what it looked like you know prior to to project, and then what it looked like um, after piling and after pile burning, um, and then just you know we're you know kind of like I, I started out with you know how are we really going to put enough people across the landscape to do this everywhere. You know, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the future brings. Um, I know, you know, state, the state itself, um, Western states, uh, the federal government. I mean, we're all working on all hands, all lands, um, improving uh, the pace and scale of treatments. And um, and I'm seeing it and, and I look forward to seeing it, you know, throughout the rest of my career. Um, um, the burning window is another thing. Um, actually, yeah, one, one quick second. Um, it, you know, we only have a limited amount of time to make these treatments happen. Um, mechanical treatments really have to be a part of the equation as we look at tens of thousands of acres just within, um, you know, our community defense zone. And then the need for fire use. Um, and just, you know, touching on the, the touchy subject of do you burn, let it burn or not? Um, and land managers face some very challenging decisions um, because, you know, we really need fire use, but we also really need to protect communities. And it's, a, um, you know, a very situation dependent um, set of uh, choices that those land managers make. No, I can't. Um, and then, again, if we didn't have to have uh, houses in there, we could have a lot better uh, fire use happening. And. And uh, that's why it is nice to see it in national parks and, and other places that uh, that don't have development. But just just wanted to point out the immense increase in houses in the wildland urban interface, um, 41 percent increase over 20 years, um, you know, more than likely an additional increase. So this is why we're doing these, you know, um, very resource intensive fuels reduction treatments um, and then the picture in the lower right is, you know, post prescribed fire, uh, what kind of what it should look like. You know, these homes are much more easy to protect than the, the ones in the other pictures. Um, pointing out some of the homes are a lot less able to uh, withstand fire than vegetation. Um, and, uh, you know, very devastating stuff. Um, but a lot of this vegetation is still green. So what we really need to do is protect those homes. And so um, as I kind of finish out this talk, like we are in these fire prone ecosystems. So we really need to adjust our, our homes and our defensible space so that if we have fire in the area, they're not immediately vulnerable. Once they catch um, the radiant heat can create the structure to structure ignition with heat, you know, far exceeding what the forest could put out um, and, and ultimately destroying homes and uh, and creating huge complications for, for people's lives. Um, what not to do and what to do um, in the middle, you know, it is possible to replace some of your wooden fences is uh, with some like wrought iron or uh, maybe sheet metal or other things that um, allow the fence to be a fence, but that don't create an additional fire hazard. Um, and then in particular is the importance of the zero to five foot zone. Um, and I just, I feel like I wouldn't, I'd be amiss to not 
throw this in there, um, you know, coming from the fire district, um, pine cones, um, juniper um, next to a wall made of shake shingles. Um, the pictures in the lower right, uh, you know, I went out and did an inspection and said, hey, you know, we can't have any um, gaps or holes that are going to let embers through to, to light needles and other things on fire. And I came back the second time and they had put all these logs over the hole. And so like, well, it's still not ember proof and um, one more try. Um, and so, you know, because a lot of this stuff does take some some work to to put in pavers and to to fully seal off um, that that zero to five foot zone, especially where embers are going to fall and land and then potentially catch the wall on fire. Um, and then just stuff underneath decks um, is just, you know, big no, no. So um, just want to kind of plug that for everybody as well. Um, we have a lot of great publications. So just a quick shot of, yeah, planter boxes, um, vegetation right next to the structure, needles and little crev crevasses that will, embers will fall and catch the thing on fire. And then this is the house that was, that was, this whole thing was modeled after. And, um, and also just wanted to point out here, vegetation still green because embers fell and hit this house, but didn't catch vegetation on fire. And that's really all I have. I know there's um, a couple other speakers with um, a lot of great information, but um, just thank you everybody. And if you haven't already done so, sign up with Placer Alert, Nevada County Emergency Alerts and Washoe County Regency Alerts. Um, uh, because if we do have a wildfire and we need to communicate with you, that is how it's gonna be done. So if you work or live in these areas, please be sure to, to register. And uh, with that, I think I'll pass it on. I think we're saving questions till the end. Thank you so much, April. Yes, we are going to just move right into our next speaker. But as I said at the beginning, if you have questions about any of this topic for any of our speakers, you can put them in the chat at any time, and then we will run through them at the end. Our next presenter, um, Dan Patterson, is going to take it away, and he is the um, fuels Management Specialist for the Tahoe National Forest. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. In, in April, you kind of stole my thunder just about everything that I was going to say. That was that was an excellent presentation. You covered a lot of information. I, I really appreciate that. Um, so I'll kind of focus on, on what we're doing um, now, like what you saw this past uh, fall burn season. So we concentrated a lot of effort on uh, the Sage Hen area where we burnt 780 acres, which is a little abnormal for us. And um, I would I would be thrilled if I could do that every spring and every fall, um, but it's typically not the case given the, the weather conditions that we have and our staffing problems. Um, so that, that burn went really well. Um, it, the main reason for that burn was to improve water quality and the watershed sheds. Um, and then we also have a number of other projects right now that we're planning that, that include all those other techniques, not, not just prescribed fire. Um, we have about six projects right now north of Truckee, all of them being uh, 3,000 acres or less. Um, and the majority being around the Boca, Prosser, and Stampede Reservoir areas to try to bolster um, uh, water protection, really. Um, and a lot of that is, is through partnerships with um, the Truckee River Watershed Council. They've been super helpful um, in providing grants and helping out with planning. And so as we move forward, it, it would be really great to transition these treatments into prescribed fire. Um, but like I said, we do, we do have a lot of problems. Um, you know, our, our windows do get very narrow, especially at high elevations. You know, we can go from fire season right into winter, as, as you all know, very fast. And then we lose that fall window that we got to take advantage of. And so with that, we go right into pile burning, where a lot of our service work, um, that would be like using mechanical means to pile biomass. Um, we can go into burning those piles. 
Um, but another thing that's important to know is the people that are out there uh, making these piles by hand, um, you know, we, we contract a lot of that stuff, uh, but the people that have to go out and burn them typically are our firefighters that fight fire all season long. So, you know, a difficult fire season, we're asking them to work, you know, over a thousand hours of overtime in a summer and then turning around and like, hey guys, let's go do some more fire stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we wanna keep employees, we can't, we can't push them till they break. And so uh, we, we have been losing people um, quite a bit. Um, we did tentatively just hire another fuels person um, to help out in the area. But uh, I mean, half of the forest for this East zone it's comprised of uh, three people, uh, counting myself. And so we count heavily on the suppression staff to help us implement a lot of this work. Um, yeah, so that's the, if there's any questions, I, I'll, I'll hang out and I'm more than happy to answer them at the end. And I'll also throw my email and uh, phone number in the chat. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, we are going to roll right into our final speaker and let me share my screen again for the slides. Joanne Beats Kaufman. Take it away, Joanne. Okay. They have the early morning person last. <laughs> I'm Joanne Beats Kaufman. And uh, just a second here. I'm a director on the Nevada County Resource Conservation District Board. And I'm also retired from the Forest Service. I, for, for the Forest Service, I was a fire scientist, fire ecologist, uh, land management planner, all kinds of things, because I've got gray hair. I've been around. I'm also a California certified burn boss. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And throughout the nation, resource conservation districts started forming in the 1940s uh, during the Dust Bowl era when there was a lot of concern about soil and water conservation. And the main emphasis for all resource conservation districts is providing technical information and education and support for good land stewardship. And an interesting fact for the Nevada County Resource Conservation District is in the 1940s, one of the primary objectives in our strategic plan was to do prescribed burning with ranchers. So we're kind of coming full circle here. And our emphasis is on working with private landowners that can include residential landowners or those with working lands, either for forestry or ranching. And really, it's all about giving them the knowledge and skills to manage their land. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we've heard a lot from April about prescribed fire. And we have a grant, a community wildfire defense grant that's funding a prescribed fire education program. Just starting on this, and believe it or not, that was funded through the infrastructure bill. So it's not just bridges and roads, it's also our, our land. Um, and really we're teaching about, to private landowners, about the intentional application of good fire. And good fire is when, especially for private landowners, when it's controlled, low intensity, and slow. Next slide, please. And we're not the only ones doing this in your area. It's also the Placer County Resource Conservation District has a very good prescribed fire education program. And we just put on a prescribed fire 101 course together up in the Truckee area. And for our program in Nevada County, some of the primary things that we're providing right now are site visits. Um, we can't do them tons of them. We can come out for people if they think they might be interested in prescribed burning and help them figure out if it's the right tool for them and give them advice on planning for a, a burn and preparation. And mostly it's going to be larger parcels, not 
um, always small ones don't lend themselves well to it. And then the primary emphasis is on hands-on courses and training, including the basics and the benefits, the planning, the preparation and permits, and very important, how to burn, and then also about fire ecology and smoke management. And we do a lot of this through demonstration burns and uh, doing that in neighborhoods where we are helping to coach those residents in doing the burn themselves. Next slide, please. So some of the things that we really emphasize in the education is in the careful use of low intensity fire is what they need to do before, whether it's pruning or pile burning, how to make a control line around the burn. During the burn, uh, how to burn slowly, carefully, how to choose the weather and making sure that it's a permissible burn day. And we work closely with the fire districts and CAL FIRE to do this. And oftentimes they participate in the training with us. They issue the permits if it's, if it's in a permit season. We teach about watching and controlling and holding the fire. It's very important, you know, just light the match. And, you know, we're not, uh, not everyone's professional, but they can learn to do the same types of functions. And then after making sure it's out, mopping up. So we kind of break it down into step by step, the pieces. Next slide, please. So we also do some work with our partners and some of this is just kind of developing over time here. One is where we've been talking with land trusts and starting to provide them with technical advice and grant collaboration. So for example, we'll go out and we'll look at a, a piece of land or an area where there's a conservation easement and give them information on whether we think it's a good candidate for burning and what kind of contract resources they might need or if they want to uh, try to take that on themselves, what kind of knowledge and people and skills they would need. And we're collaborating with them on grants, applying for grants to help provide some of those resources. So in Western Nevada County, uh, we submitted one where we included a, a prescribed burn for the Yuba Bear Burn Land Trust, excuse me, I am definitely a morning person. Anyway, the land trust over here on the west side to, to deal with invasive grasses because that's a more technical situation where you have to burn in late spring or early um, summer. And then also something is to provide adjacent public land managers with some shared common basis for evaluation of effectiveness of the prescribed burns and fire effects. So I'm a qualified um, federal fire effects monitor. And part of that role is to go out during a prescribed burn and to keep track of how they're igniting the fire, what the fire behavior is, how fast it's spreading, how hot it is, and when then what the effects are it can include an immediate assessment and it can also include pre and post uh, plots or just photos and it it there's a it it becomes a way to have a common basis whether it's the forest service burning or north tahoe fire or private landowners are we you know getting to the same common goal next slide i think that may be it <laughs> Yeah, I kept it very brief, so, but I'm here for questions and I think April was very thorough. And I'll just have to say that uh, it's a tremendous job that the Tao National Forest did this, this fall. And I, I was out there during the burn a little bit and after, and uh, great job, Dan, to you and everyone there for all, that, all those acres you got done. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers, Dan and April as well. Um, it's really great to get the varied perspectives on this issue. You know, we have 
uh, lots of public land in our area, um, but also private land and, and lots of different land managers. And so we really appreciate you all coming to speak to us tonight and presenting those different perspectives. Um, before we open questions, I just wanted to make another note. Um, I had the opportunity uh, today to attend this new conference called the Red Sky Summit. I'm actually down in the Bay Area today, um, and it's a conference that's focused on technology related to wildfire and forest health mitigation. And uh, one of the technologies that was presented today um, is mechanized uh, controlled burning through robots and um, from a company called BurnBot. And I believe there's actually going to be a pilot project done in the Tahoe Basin with that technology um, in the coming years. So, and a whole nother element to add to this discussion of um, prescribed and controlled burning. And then the last piece I just want to mention, and I'll open it up to questions, is that um, the other element that we don't have on this salon discussed is cultural burning and um, the indigenous history of burning. And April touched on it, that, that fire is a part of our history, um, that uh, the native Washoe people implemented um, essentially controlled or uh, intentional burning um, before white settlement came to the area. So there's a long history of it here. And we did actually have a salon um, in, I believe it was in 2022, we had a salon that focused more on the cultural burning um, aspect. And so I encourage you all, if you want to learn more about that piece, it's on our YouTube channel too. So um, we do have a whole video on cultural burning as well. And with those two notes, we did get some questions in the chat. So let me open that up and we will go into them. The first question came from Jeff. Um, asking if uh, our presenters can speak to the process in planning and executing a controlled burn. Um, and Jeff, do you want to expand it all on your question before we let them answer? Yeah, I unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes, go for it. Yeah, okay. I, I, did, I wanted to make sure I was adhering to the rules. I wanted to understand more about the process because for any of you involved in the Ridgewood Highlands burn, Smoke was somewhere between 1,000 and 1,300. I'm not sure of the units, but it's like in the severe unhealthy range. I've had better visibility in blizzards. It was probably down at night to 50 to 100 feet. And so I want to just better understand the process because I'm guessing the process, the desired outcome is not smoke like we experienced. Something went wrong somewhere. Maybe the weather changed. You know, I don't know exactly what happened. There was an inversion. So I wanted to understand more about that because... I get we need the fires and I appreciate all that information, but somehow we got to balance smoke control and health a little bit better than that particular burn. Yeah, I can, I can answer that, Jeff. Uh, so I'll gear this more toward the, uh, the smoke part of it because it's, it's actually quite involved process uh, to plan one of these, but um, we do work with the air quality districts and we come up with a smoke management plan. We wait for um, certain weather conditions, not only to get the achieved desire of fire effects, but also to make sure that we don't end up um, impacting communities with smoke. Um, I, I was not on that fire that you're talking about, but I would guess that it probably an inversion sat in and it's probably a place that normally does get inversions. Um, and that's always gonna be you know, a, a negative effect. Um, we, we really have to weigh, you know, is, is the exposure of smoke to the public and the people implementing these fires, is it worth um, the effects that we're getting? And, and that's another reason why we use all these other tools like harvesting timbers, timber using um, goats to, to eat some of the brush um, and trying to get rid of some of the biomass. But um, I, I would guess that that was, was an accident and there was an unforeseen weather event that caused a greater impact in the inspect, than they expected. So I hope they answered your question. That this is Joanne. I'd like to add to that because I used to do uh, research and monitoring on wildfires. And one of the things that 
I, I'm not the only one that did that, is that we know that treatments such as prescribed burning that really is the most effective at reducing the surface fuels, the litter, the duff, it, it really helps to reduce the amount of wildfire smoke. And I know that, you know, I, I would not want to have been there where you have it breathed all that smoke. But I also know all of us have uh, had horrendous months at a time of bad smoke. So definitely smoke management is not an easy thing to do. There are models that we use to help predict where the smoke's going to blow, what weather conditions, and there are many different practices, best practices used to try to minimize it. Um, but sometimes it's not going to be good. Um, just need to know that everything is done possible to minimize that. And that in the long run, um, per, you know, it's we say use your smoke. Are we choosing it when it's going to be a limited amount of time when we can do our best to control it? Or is it going to be when there's all those accumulated surface fuels still there? And during a wildfire, it's just horrific. So I, I don't like to breathe it either. Yeah, and, and I, I could, yeah. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, I, I think it was um, brave of Dan to say that, you know, maybe um, things didn't go as they had hoped. Um, and uh, and I do feel for the impact of smoke and, and especially the duration. And, you know, um, as Dan was saying, there is a complicated process. And, uh, you know, I've developed personal relationships with our partners at Placer County Air Quality um, who asked the question of how long is too long for people to put up with smoke? And, and you know, it's I mean, it, it kind of it is what it is. And, and I think we need to maintain an, an us thing about prescribed fire. Um, we're doing it to protect homes. But at the same time, we're impacting people in, in a big way. Um, and I think some of the challenge with the landscape that burned um, in the Watson Creek area is that piles were built um, quite a long time ago, um, from what I understand. Um, and there was still a lot of dead and down material in between piles. Um, and then we do want fire to creep across the landscape to do all that great heating and to consume all that fuel for all these great reasons. Um, but ultimately it was just, I think, a lot thicker and a lot deeper than anybody anticipated. And it just continued, continued. And I mean, I still am smelling it um, as I drive um, back and forth. So in the long run, we've made great progress in community protection and forest health. In the short term, we, we have had a huge impact and, um, you know, it doesn't fix anything, but I do sympathize with everybody in there. But can I ask a follow-up, Nicole? Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. So I guess April, maybe Dan, I get we've got to do all this. Both of you have alluded to, hey, things probably could have gone a little better. Nothing's perfect. I just wondered, do they ever do any look backs after this? Something didn't go quite right. Maybe the piles were deeper than they thought they were going to be. Hey, should we collect other data the next time? I don't know the answer to all that. I'm not the expert. I just wondered if they do some kind of look back to say, hey, we didn't quite get the right outcome here. What could we do different the next time? Because I've been up there when there's been smoke from some of the fires, either the South Shore or somewhere north. Nothing has been as dense as it was in the evening in Ridgewood Highlands. I mean, I had friends come visit. I was driving with them. It was a good thing. I mean, you couldn't see a street set. You couldn't even see the snow poles. Um, so I'm guessing, hey, something didn't go quite right. Either the weather, the burns, the duff, whatever it was. I'm more looking at, hey, we can't do anything about what happened. Can we do better in the future? And so I just wondered if somebody goes out and tries to collect lessons learned to say, hey, yeah, we learned a few things. Let's try to employ this the next time. Um, so just wondered about that process. Um, and maybe I'll jump in there. Uh, if you don't mind, Dan, Ray, maybe you should go first. Yeah, go ahead, April. It sounds like you have more knowledge of, of what happened. Well, I did want to say that um, in my communications with Placer County Air Quality, um, they were very much in touch with the folks and, and these are um, Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit. So, um, you know, all Forest Service, but, you know, 
not not Dan's burn. He's he's out of the basin. Um, and 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 you know all of this is is great work. And I just quick plug on the 780 acres in Sage Hen. That's really awesome. Um, but as as I was communicating with Placer County Air Quality, the, they indicated that there will be um, an after action review type meetings to look at one, like why was there such a huge gap between when forests were thinned and when piles were burned? A lot of that comes with our patchwork dynamic of funding um, and our patchwork dynamic of staffing. So they need to prioritize things for one reason or another. Um, you know, some of it's like, well, you know, there may have been decisions in the past. It's like, let's just let stuff rot for a while. And then the new decision is like, we're not removing any fuel by cutting it and putting it in piles and, and having those piles turn into their own <laughs> habitats for some creatures. Um, so I will say that, yes, um, a lot of um, review has already taken place and it will continue to, you know, and I can't say that this will never happen again, um, but we are always making, you know, as best decisions as we can um, with the limited time and resources we have to put fire on the ground. And I think another reason that the burning happened prior to Thanksgiving is that's when we have staff and then people are laid off. So like conditions might've been better down the line, but we wouldn't have anybody to do the burn. Um, so there's just so many um, variables and, uh, you know, and unfortunately the short straw ended up being smoke impacts. Thank you very much. One last just question. just. Is there a place for the public to find out some of that information? I'm just more concerned about, hey, you're doing the look backs. That's great. I just, I'm looking for some accountability. And it sounds like the air management agency is doing that. And that's wonderful. I just was kind of like, hey, can I kind of do the follow through to just say, hey, what'd you do with the data that you got? Would you follow up with the air management agency or, or me? You know, I think your best way to know more about that is just to contact the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit and um and and what meetings they've had because i'm not privy to them um but i know they're communicating with class or air and um and uh, yeah and I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to find uh so, some some follow-up information on those follow-up meetings um regarding that burn jeff if you need any assistance finding a contact person at the lake tahoe basin management unit i'd be happy to help you um get in touch with someone is that people. part of the fires oh, am i on the is that part of the fire service? Forest service, yeah. Forest so service. The, okay, the I can find it from that. I in wasn't. The Lake sure. Tahoe Basin is called the gotcha. Lake Tahoe Basin Management gotcha. Unit. Yes. Okay. Thanks. All right. We did have another question um, that I'll move on to from Kate. Uh, she asked, "Does burying trees or wood chips effectively eliminate the release of carbon into the atmosphere, and why isn't it that done more?" She also referenced the air quality in the region. Um, and, and, you know, if there's alternative options to, to the smoke impacts and or carbon release. I can answer some of that. Um, you know, soil scientists have looked at, and it and sounds like April may know a lot about soils, but I'll start something. Wood, wood chips and heavy carbon um, onto the soil tends to suck up nitrogen so it does, it, it can decompose, but it tends to really just change the whole environment. And in the, the dry Western US, sometimes that just decomposition doesn't happen very fast if it does at all. And you've just rearranged the fuels. And in many cases, you may have greatly increased the amount of surface fuels. And we call them in, in the fire behavior world, spotting beds. And in fact, I was on a field trip in the Lake Tahoe Basin, I won't say how many years ago. And we were there and we were in an area that had been chipped. And one of the fire, the guys from an incident management team, a fire operations um, expert looked at it and he said, that's a spotting bed, the embers land there, they're more likely to catch on fire. And then when it gets windy, they blow. So as far as burying it, it's possible. I don't know how good that would be for the soil myself. Um, I think it it's not necessarily an ideal situation and certainly leaving it's not good. So April, you, you know a lot about soil nutrient cycling, I can tell. Thanks, 
Sure. So yeah, um, you know, you, you, you totally hit it there, Joanne. Um, it's a, known as the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And, um, and I think it's 50 to one is what I'm roughly remembering. But yeah, once you start loading up a bunch of additional carbon on the ground, um, all this nitrogen bacteriums and, and uh, you know, as we were talking about nitrogen a little bit, so these bac bacteria um, basically get activated and they can break down uh, nitrogen in the soil to make it plant available. Um, and so as you add more and more and more carbon, they really can't do their thing to in, in decomposition um, uh, because uh, basically stuff is too busy um, trying to break down carbon to like make nutrients available for plants. So there is a fuels and fire surrogate study that was put out um, and I was uh, trying to take a minute to find that link, but if you look up fuels and fire surrogate study and it was produced not that long ago, but it really looks at soils and nitrogen cycling um, from mechanical treatments. Um, uh, I think there's a couple different type of mechanical treatments and then thinning and prescribed fire. And it, you know, there it's important to do the mechanical treatments because we just can't really put fire everywhere that we historically could. Um, but it does have some drawbacks. And um, yeah, and that's kind of one of them. And, and you know, I, the other component too is the more stuff you have on the ground, the less moisture is actually reaching the soil. I mean, yeah, it also acts as mulch, but it, it you know, gets wet and dries off before uh, moisture reaches the ground. So that makes an, an additional challenge for our bigger trees. Um, and I might be missing the, the question a little bit, but, but yeah, you know, in, in a lot of cases, we can load a lot of stuff onto the ground, but really once you get past six inches, it, um, it really is kind of detrimental to the forest ecosystem. But catastrophic wildfire is worse. Um, and I have seen a lot of really great mechanical treatments, especially um, years three and four that, you know, you got nothing but healthy trees out there, a very defendable slope. And, you know, maybe it doesn't have all the little niche and nooks and crannies that um, a hand thinning treatment would do, but it gets us to a point where we could actually put um, natural fire on the, or prescribed fire on the ground. Um, and in time, you know, those little hollowed logs and, you know, snags and other things that create more biodiversity, they will come. And especially since we haven't had a catastrophic wildfire, um, you know, we are doing a, a huge favor ecologically, um, you know, that, that might not be best, but it's it's a pretty darn good surrogate, if you will. So yeah, fuels and fire surrogate, and um, I'll try to uh, pop a link in there if I can get it. Yeah, excellent point, April. And the only thing I was add is that um, it's definitely another tool in the toolbox. I just prefer that the chips are left piled and even better yet hauled off and used somewhere else. Um, would, it's hard to get those uses, but that's the ideal. Yeah, and, and I will say, because I, I think I might have missed some of the question, but if you're a homeowner and you have chip and stuff, um, it can be a great you know, ground cover it, and it, it is actually less flammable than needles. So, um, you know, if you, because we also have a chipping program, um, and if you, uh, while it would be better hauled off or, you know, pitched into the garbage can, um, you can spread that stuff around the yard a little bit. Most of what we have is we already have litter and duff there, so adding chip to it isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, but we just make sure it's not in the five-foot zone, um, and then it's not more than three inches deep. There was a follow up uh just what are the benefits what about the benefits of biochar i don't know if any of you can touch on that piece i can if no one else can but i april or dan do you work with that at all no i i haven't really worked too much with biochar i know um we're looking at using some of it on the north Eva project to help with the uh, mine remediation um, stuff to kind of help build up the soils there. But yeah, I, it's, it, it's you know, it's just like putting charcoal there. The good thing about it is it's not decomposing so that it's not releasing carbon into the atmosphere. 
um, but it is providing some of the carbon benefits to the soil, like water holding capacity. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely got its proponents. And I know that a lot of people do it on a small scale. On a large scale, there is equipment, um, but it's, it's not cheap to run. So April, I, I know there have been demonstrations in the Lake Tahoe Basin. I don't know if much has happened with that. And perhaps the person that asked the question knows more than I do about its use there. Thank you all. Um, well, we are almost out of time and I don't see any further questions. So I think we're gonna wrap up and just wanna thank our presenters again, April, Joanne and Dan, thank you so much for your time today. April just put the link to the fire um, surrogate study in the chat and we can also send a link to that out um, with the recording from the salon when we send that out in a couple of days. Um, and just one last thing I wanna mention is our upcoming events at the Community Foundation. Um, the next round of our funding program for private property forest management is going to open on Tuesday, January 9th. And we will also be hosting an application workshop on Tuesday, January 9th at 4 p.m. And so that is for um, private property owners with parcels uh, minimum size of three acres up to 5,000 acres to apply for technical and funding assistance to manage your forest land. Um, and we will resume our salon series in the new year as well. And so we will share information about the upcoming salon when we have that to share. Um, and just want to thank you all for your participation tonight. And we will be sending the recording out within a few days. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a great night.